Hi there, Smart Drivers talking to you tonight about electric vehicles. And this is completely off topic, but I want to ask you the question and leave the answer in the comments. What business is McDonald's in? And I'll reveal the answer to you about what that has to do with electric cars here in a little bit. Talking about electric vehicles. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s, drove for Greyhound in one of the regional buses, uh, bus lines in Australia when I was going to university there in the early 2000s. 1997 became a licensed commercial driving instructor. Most of my driving instruct instruction has been with uh, semi-trucks, air brakes, uh, buses, uh, log books, all that good stuff. And uh, 2006, I graduated from the University of Melbourne with a doctorate in legal history, which some of you may or may not know is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And in 2015, I started the online business, the YouTube channel, and it has been wildly more successful than I could have ever imagined. Uh, some good stuff to look at. I was talking about uh, reasons why it's easier to take your driver's test in the wintertime. Uh, have a look at that blog post. Uh, these links are down in the description there and as well space the final frontier this is the premise for the new defensive driving model that i've created called smarter defensive driving and it's essentially it's about keeping space in front of your vehicle on the roadways and i learned from my friend sam there a driving instructor in the bronx that tailgate crashes or rear end crashes rather are the number one crashes in north america even more so <laughs> then windshield damage repairs reported to insurance companies. So keep your distance, stay away, predict uh, traffic in front of you and start to slow early so that you can maintain that distance, especially now in the winter time so that you're not sliding into the vehicle in front of you. And I was coming down from the ski hill today and uh, touched the brakes and realized that I was at that transition period between where it was raining in the valley and it was snowing up on the mountain. And where I was at was sheer ice and touch the brake uh, in response to the vehicle braking in front of me and uh, the vehicle the buggy just kept on skidding so yes good distance in front of your vehicle so we're looking at electricity as a power source where does electricity come from yes the propaganda and rhetoric for most places on the west coast and in north america is that it is hydroelectric dams but there are many places, West Virginia, Australia, China, that burn coal and have nuclear power plants that generate electricity. And this is not to say that petrol, uh, the, uh, the drilling for oil is not without its problems as well. Uh, there are claims that drilling for oil, oil is finite and eventually the supply of oil, fossil fuels is going to run out. Uh, you know, of course... Drilling for oil, oil refineries, all of that sort of thing. Yes, those are problematic, no doubt about it. Of course, nuclear power, we have the nuclear rods, which are uh, left afterwards, and these things are radioactive and have a half-life of something like 500,000 years or some crazy amount of time. I don't know exactly what it is, so you'd have to look that half-life up. Uh, Cold fire electric plants, Australia, as I talked about, West Virginia, China, other places in the world uh, generate electricity from coal. And then, of course, diesel generators. <laughs> in some places in the world, they actually burn diesel fuel to generate electricity. Manufacturing a new electric car. Manufacturing any new car requires 1,500 barrels of oil because you have to realize that most of the plastics in these vehicles is petroleum-based. And as well, the centralization of materials. The materials are not manufactured and uh, created in one place in the world. For example, uh, you know, the mufflers are created in another place and they have to be shipped to the plant to be assembled on the vehicle. So you have 1,500 barrels of oil to manufacture one new vehicle. <laughs> So, just to manufacture these vehicles, there is petroleum products and uh, oil that's put in place to be able to do this. So, there's energy to produce these new vehicles. Not to mention the cost is prohibitive for most people. Uh, $50,000, $70,000 for a new electric vehicle. And then infrastructure. We're now creating two infrastructures. We already have an infrastructure in place for 
petrol engines for gasoline and diesel engines. Uh, now we're creating charging stations. So in addition to fuel stations, the gas station on the corner store, now we have all these charging stations around as well in addition to the uh, fuel stations. Auto repair shops, are these going to have to change in response to electric vehicles being involved in crashes because they are going to be involved in crashes? Uh, battery replacement, service and disposable, what are we gonna do with the batteries? And there has been a lot of rumbling and rumors about the fact that they can't simply uh, dispense of these batteries. Uh, body shops, and are we duplicating infrastructure? And yes, absolutely, we're duplicating infrastructure. Not to mention the questions about is the electrical grid in California and in Canada by 2035, which is less than 15 years away, is the electrical grid going to be able to handle the demands of more electricity? Because over the decades, we are requiring more electricity. Our computers are on most of the day. We have all of these uh, uh, remote control electronics in our houses that require electricity. So you know, and most houses now have central air, uh, electric heat pumps and those types of things. Is the grid going to be able to handle the amount of electricity that's required for new vehicles? Now, here's the other piece of thinking about infrastructure, thinking about the old infrastructure of gasoline cars and diesel engines. And just as a sort of a comparison, horses, the transition from horse-drawn traffic to motor traffic in the late 19th century, uh, early 20th century. The first motor car came along in kind of 1895. They were very popular by the 1930s. Uh, everybody had a Model T, everybody had cars. Uh, the used car market had, was booming by the uh, late 1920s, early 1930s. Despite all of the benefits of the motor car, the last horse, did not go off the road until the early 1980s. The early 1980s. So despite all of the benefits of the motor car, the last horses took just less, just a little bit less than a century before the last horses went off the road, despite the, all the benefits. So if it took that long for that infrastructure to dwindle out and be replaced by the motor car, how long is it going to take to replace the current infrastructure of gasoline cars and diesel engines with electric vehicles. Is it going to be <laughs> a dozen years from now? Probably not. It's probably going to take a lot more than that. And we do not see the benefits of electric cars uh, that you did when you compare horses to cars. There's just not the sheer number of uh, benefits to that. And exactly what Jake said there, you know, there are some limitations. The range, how far the electric vehicle can go and how well it performs in extreme temperatures, extreme heat and extreme cold. It doesn't do well in those. Not to mention for gasoline engines, you got the gearheads, uh, the reliability of gas engines and how far they will go, their range. I mean, some of these gas engines now are getting 45, 50 miles to the gallon. They'll get you 1,000, 1,200 kilometers to a tank of fuel, which is about 750, 800 miles to a tank of fuel. <clears throat> I asked you in the, in the introduction, and here is what I was talking about in terms of McDonald's. Most of us see McDonald's as being a fast food restaurant chain. In fact, McDonald's is in the real estate business. McDonald's owns more real estate than the Catholic Church. So that is where their wealth stands is in real estate. It's the same thing with electric vehicles. Tesla and all of these other auto manufacturers are not in the electric vehicle business. They are in the battery business. Uh, one of the videos I was watching this morning over on uh, Engineering Explained was talking about semi-vehicles or semi-trucks and putting ba having battery-operated semi-trucks. He was saying that currently the batteries are so big and so cumbersome that it would take up 20% of the overall load of a semi-truck just for the capacity of the batteries in the electric motor. So it's simply not feasible. Tesla's cars are kind of the sweet spot for batteries that the batteries are still big and cumbersome, but uh, <laughs> 
it works in cars, but it doesn't work on anything bigger than a car uh, in terms of battery power. So this is another comparison of this is when you think of the iPhone and you think of the iPad, the reason that these became so popular was not because of the iPhone and the technology in the iPhones, they became popular because of battery technology. The shrinking of the batteries and making the battery small allowed phones to become portable and iPods to become portable. And so Mac, Apple Macintosh, was in the battery business. They were not in the smartphone and the iPad business. They were in the battery business, the same thing as electric vehicles. If these are going to move, move forward, the technology of batteries has to improve. Okay, the reality, and Jake talked about this, and there was an article, the our, our post, a tweet, the other day on Twitter, and somebody was talking about sub-zero temperatures trying to charge their Tesla, and their Tesla absolutely would not charge up. So the life of the batteries, disposal of the batteries, is this going to be environmental? They don't do well in extreme hot and extreme cold temperatures. They don't do well for long ranges. Uh, and the range of the vehicles. Uh, the kid's mom had a Tesla a few years, a couple years ago, and the range of the Tesla was only about an hour and a half drive, and then it had to be recharged uh, for it to um, to make the return trip. So she had to go down and fast charge it, and she was gone probably 40 minutes to fast charge uh, the Tesla and bring it back down. So what is the answer? The answer for the transition between gasoline engines and full electric vehicles is hybrid vehicles. We can't go to full electric yet. The battery technology is not there, okay? The Toyota Prius has withstood the test of time and some of these taxi cabs have 1.2, 1.3 million kilometers on them, which is 900,000 miles. Uh, incredible abuse driving as taxis. They're up and down through city traffic and those types of things. And these vehicles have proven reliable. They have the range, they have the mileage, not to mention that the gasoline engine and the electric engines are symbiotic. And this, as I said, will work to facilitate the transition from gasoline engines to full electric vehicles that may come in another half a decade or half a century, not, you know, not in the next 12 years for sure. So I would suggest that we push the hybrid vehicles because they're symbiotic. Uh, if the gasoline engine is running, then it's charging the electric batteries on the vehicle. And then uh, when not needed, then you can use the electric uh, motors on the vehicles and those types of things. And when I was in Spain, we were driving uh, with one of the agents and she said she was trading in her car because in Barcelona, you had to have a hybrid vehicle that was capable of 60 kilometers on the electric uh, engines to be allowed within the city of Barcelona. So I think this is very much the way that we need to go. So good luck in your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. We are in uh, the post storm <laughs> of the century in uh, winter driving. We got a lot of winter driving going on. If you are not comfortable in the winter time, please don't drive, okay? Stay home. Unfortunately, a number of people I don't know whether they were elderly, who they were, or those types of things, but they're talking about scores of people having died because of winter storms uh, in Ontario and New York State and other places like that. So if you're not comfortable driving in the wintertime, please stay home. And I'm going to put up some shorts. I've been out on the highways here uh, when it was extremely cold here for the last 10 days, and now it's warming up again. And of course, so we had extreme cold weather. We had hard pack on the roads because when it's extremely cold, they can't get the snow off. It just builds up and you get this hard pack layer. And uh, now it's warmed up to freezing. And of course, now it's slush and ice and wet. And it's actually as dangerous, if not more so dangerous than it is when it's sub-zero temperatures, when you have all this slush on the road that's going to push you around. So if you're not comfortable driving in that and you're not going to be doing at least the speed limit please stay home, okay? Take a cab, get somebody to give you a ride, take the bus, do something else, but you're endangering not only yourself, but other people out on the roadways if you're not comfortable driving in these conditions. Uh, elevator, have been uh, charging stations for electric vehicles in parking lots. Uh, yes, and we have a new infrastructure. We're talking about that as well during the presentation. And uh, as I said, 
We're going to talk about all of that. Uh, Garden State here left a comment this morning. <laughs> this would be interesting, and yes, it is interesting. And uh, quite a number of videos over on the, uh, if you want to know more about this and you want to get right into the details and the math of all the electric vehicles and whatnot, uh, check out uh, Engineering Explained over there as well. A lot of stuff over there. I looked at a couple of videos. They're just like, yeah, that's way too much math for me. <laughs> I'm looking at electric vehicles from the social driving perspective. And I was having lunch today with all the sort of soccer moms and those types of things. And uh, we, I asked the question about it. And the one mom said, if she... If her electric vehicle would not go 12 hours, because it's approximately, well, four and a half, so say nine hours. So from Vernon to Vancouver is four and a half hours. If she said if the electric vehicle didn't go to Vancouver and return, which is nine hour trip, that she didn't, she wasn't interested in buying an electric vehicle. And this is one of the limitations of the electric vehicles right now. And of course, <laughs> Jake said the same thing, that he has a leaf and in extreme temperatures, it doesn't work well. And of course, the range isn't great. So if you're driving outside of cities, electric vehicles aren't really going to work for you currently and as well. But if you're in the cities and just driving around and those types of things, uh, then yeah, that may work out for you if you're only driving at 15 or 20 miles and then coming back, charging it up and away you go, those types of things. Okay, so it's going to be great for you. Uh, had a couple of questions today about why it's easier to take your driver's test in the winter time and it is easier to take your driver's test in the winter time i strongly encourage you to book your test do not wait for the spring uh and uh, one of the smart drivers the other day said that they took their test in the winter time and that it was super easy the other piece that they filled in for me was was another benefit that i hadn't thought about in the winter time you don't have bicycles on the roadway you have less pedestrians and you have less traffic in the winter time so those are other benefits that you have uh to encourage you to take your test in the winter time you know of course as i said you don't have to uh get eight to ten, ten inches eight to twelve inches from the curb uh you just have to park in behind the car in front of you you don't have to park between the lines from reverse stall parking just beside the car that you're parked in beside uh you don't uh the driving examiner is going to be more relaxed going to be a little bit more lenient you can go a little bit slower uh, in residential areas in those places that have been plowed and whatnot so know that take your test in the winter time uh pixels uh he says it takes 25 minutes to fully charge a tesla or an electric vehicle and yes it does uh so if you're out it's not like filling up your <laughs> gasoline car where you go in 10 minutes you're in and out of the fuel pumps uh it's gonna it's gonna take a while even with a fast charge fred said that tesla just launched semi trucks to pepsi and uh fred <laughs> i know that they they do that but i just i don't think that that will last very long i mean it may work in the city where they can get back to the charging facility and get the vehicles charged and those types of things uh but um I don't think that it's going to, the, the battery technology is just not there yet to put these things into semi trucks. Uh, Connor, hey Rick, your videos helped me a lot and I drive an Audi. Connor, that is awesome and awesome that you're able to drive an Audi, my friend. That is great news. Thank you so much. Uh, Mallory, we need to know more information about electric cars before they become normal on the roads. And Mallory, they are you know, in Vancouver, there are a lot of electric vehicles, but where you live, Mallory, with extreme temperatures uh, in the summer and into the winter, I just don't think that it's going to work out just yet. We're just not there. Uh, electric, do electric vehicles run on gas? <laughs> Elevator, no, they don't run on gas. They run on electricity. So they have batteries that store power uh, when you plug them in and the batteries are charged up and then it's just like your phone it runs on battery power and as the battery power dwindles then uh, that's where it gets power from the other issue with them is, is because they don't deal with like extreme cold is because these electric engines do not have a byproduct of heat as gasoline and diesel engines do so the byproduct is heat and then you can heat the cabin of the of the car uh, from the byproduct of heat that is generated by uh, gasoline engines. Uh, Sage says Teslas are toy cars, and yes, uh, they are. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with that statement. Uh, DRS, uh, maybe by 2050, batteries will be good enough, not uh, by the next decade, and yes, I agree. Uh, Waldo, no hybrids do. 
Uh, very polarizing topic today. Yes, well, it's I don't know whether it's polarizing, but it's just unfortunately the mandates are being put in place that you know by 2035 we're all going to be electric, and that is just not a realistic goal to think that in a dozen years that we're going to have electric vehicles in place. Because I mean, we can we can make all kinds of wild claims about technology, but the the reality is is that. The battery technology is simply not that there yet, and there are simply too many questions that are left unanswered. For example, what is what is the lifetime of these batteries? How long do they last? Do they last two years? Do they last five years? Do they last 10 years? How long before they start degrading to the point where, yes, you get a brand new vehicle with batteries in it. For example, you buy a new Leaf, as Jake has, and you know for the first two years it's awesome and then after that the batteries are almost rendered useless and won't take you for more than you know an hour trip where you have to recharge the batteries because they have degraded so poorly in such a short span of time so these are the questions that need to be answered the reason that i advocate for hybrid vehicles is because the toyota prius has been around for uh, you know, 15 years probably now, and it has been has proven reliable. And you know, it gets astronomical fuel economy, probably 50, 60 miles to the gallon. I can't, I don't even know what the numbers are for sure. But the fact that they're running as taxi cabs not only shows the reliability of the car, but also you know how efficient they are uh, running around in towns and those types of things. Uh, Colton power plants pollutes the environment more in one day than most internal combustion cars do in a year or more. And yes, that's true. Fortunately, we're getting some environmental uh, measures in place to control some of this and to, you know, eliminate some of that pollution for sure. Uh, Jake, back to weight. These batteries that are in local box trucks and tractors that can go 200 on a perfect day empty. Uh, clicks weigh several tons. My truck tanks full are at 400 kilos. Yes, and uh, <laughs> that was one of the pieces of information that uh, the guy, I don't even know his name is, the guy on Engineering Explained was talking about, was talking about the batteries in a semi-truck that currently, with current battery technology, the batteries in a semi-truck weighed 20% of the truck. So he was taking 80,000 pounds in the U.S., 20%. So the batteries, the batteries, the electric motors, all of the other accessories that are required for electric vehicles, 20%. Whereas a diesel engine and the fuel for the diesel engine only comprise 1% of the load. And of course, the point that he was making was is that trucking companies get paid on how much cargo they haul. And so if you can only haul 80% of the cargo that you once could, you're losing 20% of your revenue. Well, trucking companies are already, you know, working on a razor, razor's edge in terms of their uh, profit margins. There's no way that they can reduce 20%. And there's no way that an electric vehicle, an electric engine is going to make up that much money in, uh, fu in fuel costs and electricity costs, right? So... Uh, traveling, do the charging stations have a cost to use them? Uh, Ant, as far as I know, they do. <coughs> um, Jake, uh, the charging stations, are they? Are you charged for the charging stations? I don't have an electric vehicle, so I don't know. Uh, Young, maybe I should put uh, my Tesla stock into Exxon instead. <laughs> uh, Young, perhaps, but if you bought your Tesla stock at the beginning of the company, then you're probably doing all right with it right now. Uh, Mallory, some places even use water to generate electricity. Yes, they do. A, a lot of places do use water to generate electricity. But again, it comes back to, you know, ele hydroelectricity dams are not without their environmental impact. That they displace a lot of land when you build a dam because now you're creating a lake behind the dam. And how much, you know, the of course, the environmental uh, impact of building concrete, uh, electrical wires, all of that infrastructure that goes in and around the dam because you have to move the electricity out from the dam. How much land have you flooded when you build a hydroelectric dam? Uh, the Colorado River, for example, in the United States of America, uh, no longer flows out to the ocean because it is so heavily dammed 
uh, you know, not not cursed, but dammed by hydroelectric dams that the water is held back and is generating so much electricity that doesn't flow out into the ocean any longer. So hydroelectric dams are not without their issues as well and their environmental impact. Uh, Corey, so in a hybrid, the conventional half gas picks up the slack in more adverse weather temperatures as opposed to pure electric. Uh, yes, that's true, Corey. So if you're driving a hybrid, you're running around in the city and those types of things, then you can drive on the electric engine component of it. But out on the highways or places where you need more power and those types of things, yes, the petrol engine will kick in. And not only will the electric engine or the gasoline engine kick in and run the vehicle, but also it will also charge the electric, uh, the batteries in the vehicle as well. So it works it's a symbiotic relationship that if the gasoline engine is running or you're braking the vehicle, it's charging the batteries uh, in the vehicle as well. So it'll pick up that slack exactly. Uh, Epic, I can see driving schools going into the trend of electric and hybrid vehicles. If you own one or the other, you will encounter the problem of having the doors freeze, which is another problem of electric vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because you don't have all that residual heat from the engine when you shut it off that prevents freezing of the doors and whatnot. Uh, I hadn't thought about that epic about the doors freezing because there's no residual heat uh, coming off the engine when you shut it off in cold temperatures. Uh, Jake, uh, some do the commercial companies blink for one, uh, usually do same as petrol stations. Many um, Blink for one usually do same as petrol. So uh, many businesses or municipalities provide service for free. Uh, fees are usually just market hydro rate. Okay, so there you go. So some do, some don't. Uh, Colton, hydroelectric power is a pain to get ready because of the time it takes to build the dam correctly. Yes, and and not only that, they're expensive. They're huge infrastructure projects. I mean, uh, I don't know how many people here remember the Three Gorges Dam that they built in China it was an incredibly huge hydroelectric dam that displaced, uh, if I recall correctly, it was a million people were displaced by the lake that was created by the, behind the Three Gorges Dam in China. Tremendously huge hydroelectric dam. And, you know, the other thing about electric cars and charging electric cars with electricity, as I said, we have more and more and more demands on the grid already because of our living style. Uh, most of us, as I said, we have uh, heat pumps. They're pushing heat pumps here in Canada. They're pushing uh, central air. Just about everybody has central air in their house now. So all of that is putting extra demands on the system. We all have computers. We all have lights, uh, especially in the wintertime when we have shorter days. Uh, we all have electronics. We all have uh, iPhones, uh televisions, stereos, iPads, all of this stuff requires more and more and more electricity. And the question, you know, the question that I'm asking is, is, is that the electrical get grid going to be hand, is it going to be able to handle these extra demands of electric vehicles uh, that we're generating and, you know, mandating into place by 2035? Uh, Jason, off topic, where's the best location to find a manual transmission car to start learning to drive a stick in America, especially around Minnesota? Jason... <laughs> you're looking for a manual car in the United States of America. You're going to, yeah, just uh, do a lot of searching on Auto Trader and those types of things. They are around. There are manual transmissions around. I mean, I don't know what your feelings are about a Jeep. Personally, I wouldn't buy one, but Jeep comes in a, as it uh, comes with a manual transmission. There are uh, some sports cars. I think you can buy a Subaru WRX that still has a manual transmission. Uh, so look around. And uh, start learning how to drive a manual transmission. Yeah, you can, as Waldo says, yeah, get a $500 beater car and uh, you can learn to drive manual car that way. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be looking at an older car uh, because I know even the Audis stopped producing uh, manual cars in North America. I think it was around 2012. Uh, you'd have to find a manual car uh, that's an older car as well. Uh, Colton, there was a dam built somewhere in Europe that took the record for the tallest one, but a layer of clay meant that the water it can hold behind it is nowhere near the top. In fact, it's less than 50%. Uh, yes, another issue with that. So I don't know whether that answered your question or not, Jason, about a manual car, but um, 
yeah, you're probably either going to have to buy an older one or look for one of the specific manufacturers that are still uh, building uh, manual vehicles. As I said, Jeep is one of those. Uh, Jake, like clockwork, uh, June and July, power goes out at the cabin for upwards of days on end. Kind of defeats the point of emissions reduction when I'm charging my car on a diesel generator. <laughs> uh, yes, it is, Jake. And I've seen pictures of that on Facebook and other social media platforms where the electric car is sitting there being charged with a diesel generator, for sure. That completely uh, you know, negates any benefit any environmental benefit when you're using a diesel generator you might as well just have a diesel car right and this is i mean this is the other piece i mean we've talked about this in previous live streams about uh diesel cars i'm not sure why we're not promoting uh diesel engine technology uh my aunt had a diesel rabbit which was the predecessor to the golf the volkswagen golf in the 1970s and even in the 1970s that diesel rabbit was getting 55 miles to the gallon and people say yes diesel engines are dirty and this and that but the thing is is if you've got a car that's going 55 miles on a gallon of diesel fuel isn't there less environmental impact because it's so efficient in use of fuel i mean think about that today in terms of the automotive technology electronics and just advancements in automotive technology i mean probably a diesel a, a four-cylinder diesel engine now is probably going to get 100 miles to the gallon easily. I just don't understand why we're not we're not doing that. Uh, Connor, I live in Austin, Texas, by the way. Uh, I was looking there, Connor. <laughs> Austin. Austin's a great place. Uh, DRS, we are not ready for electric cars. Okay. Uh, Jake, the new larger electric vehicles can provide power back into your house as a generator. Mine is too old and feeble to do so. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Colton, buy an old pickup truck with a four-speed floor shift and a three-speed column shift. You'll be in luck, Jason. Uh, Colton, uh, you know, he wants an older car. He doesn't want an antique. <laughs> Three in the trees went out in the 1970s, my friend. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. He doesn't want to shop at a museum for a manual car. <laughs> a four-speed. I can't even, I, I can't even remember the last time I was in a vehicle that had a four-speed transmission in it. Oh, that that's a long time ago. Uh, Colton, I'll do you one better. What if you got 200 miles per gallon in a gasoline car? Uh, Colton, yeah. Why, why can't we get 200 miles to the gallon in a uh, petrol engine? I just, I don't understand. Uh, Chewy, uh, hybrids are middle ground, I think. And yes, they are. I, I completely agree with that. I think that... Uh, hybrid cars are the transition. They will facilitate the transition from gas engines to full electric vehicles or some other type of m a better fuel source, a better power source for vehicles because we need to drive. There's absolutely no doubt about it. And there's, you know, there's no reason why we can't have a better source of power that has a less environmental impact. You know, I'm all on board for all of that, but I just, at this juncture, I'm not convinced that electric vehicles are, you know, the, the battery technology is the limiting factor of moving forward with electric vehicles. And I think by the end of the 20th or this decade, that, that automotive manufacturers are going to realize, they're going to say, they're finally going to just realize that the numbers are not going to add up. That they're going to lose money on their electric vehicles and they're finally going to say until we move forward with battery technology it is not fiscally viable for us to manufacture electric vehicles we're just not making any money on this uh ray uh what do you think about the kia uh ev6 ricks uh, i don't know anything about it i would have to do some research on that uh personally as i said <laughs> I wouldn't buy a Kia, but that's just my personal opinion. Uh, Klaus, I uh, hope you're doing well. A hybrid car would be a good choice for me. Yes, it will, my friend. Uh, Epic, what do you think of Canadian provinces like Nova Scotia, Ontario, Quebec uh, going for electric cars for 100% driving schools with electric vehicles? You know, Epic, uh, I don't know whether that's going to work out or not because especially when it's busy in the summertime, June, July, and August are the busiest times for driving schools. 
and they are out on the road 10 or 12 hours a day with their vehicles, when are they going to have time to charge the vehicles? Will the vehicle go for that length of time without having a, without having a battery charge? It's probably not, uh, a, it's not an option for them, that they just can't go that long. Now, if they had a hybrid vehicle, that that's probably going to work out for them, especially if they have a plug-in charge hybrid vehicle, then they can park it overnight, they can charge it up, and if they <clears throat> are out for long periods of time during their busy time of the year, the summer months, then you know that's going to be a better possibility for them, but I just don't think electric vehicles are going to work for them. Uh, Fernie, what do you think of the newly released uh, Tesla Semi that proved to go 500 miles on a full charge at max weight? Uh, Fernie, as I said, I'll refer you over to Engineering Explained. He was talking about semi trucks. The batteries are the limiting factor, especially on those semi trucks. Uh, it doesn't matter, 500 miles. Um, it's there's too much weight in the batteries and if you're hauling heavy in the United States, it's not going to be viable. If you're not hauling heavy, if you're not hauling full weight, if you're not hauling steel, you're not hauling liquid, uh, what else is heavy that I can think of off the top of my head? You're not hauling garbage, you're not hauling timber, those types of things. As long as you're not hauling any of those types of cargoes that are extremely heavy, then you're going to be fine. And it's the same thing uh, when I was hauling flat deck years ago in Ontario, we had aluminum trailers uh, with small Freightliner trucks in them, and the truck and trailer only weighed 28,000 pounds. So when you're running in the States, you're allowed 80,000 pounds. So we had a truck and trailer with fuel weighed 28,000 pounds. You could put 52,000 pounds of cargo on the deck, which is unheard of. Just absolutely unheard of for most trucks and trailers, uh, which is an incredible amount of cargo. And you can make a lot of money because you can haul more cargo. But if you've got batteries that are weighing 20% of what the truck weighs, the load, so you're talking 80,000 pounds overall amount and 20,000 pounds is your batteries in your, in your engine, you can only haul 60,000 pounds. Well, 20,000 is for the batteries. And then the truck and trailer is probably going to weigh another 10,000 pounds, so 30 or 15,000 pounds. It just, it's not viable. It's just not viable. And the infrastructure is not in place yet for semi trucks to be running electric. I mean, maybe for Pepsi that's running around the city and those types of things, perhaps, but it's yet to be seen whether this is going to work or not. Uh, Jake, transit maybe electric uh, passenger rail and trackless trolley bus is not a popular topic for driver seminars, but most of personal travel is commuting or large volume travel. Yes. Uh, Waldo Epic, you are asking a lot about driving schools. I'm a driving instructor. When I worked for Young Drivers of Canada, they were thinking going entirely electric. The problem is when I worked far from home, the battery would not last longer than 10 hours. I wouldn't be able to do an entire day. Exactly. And that was, Waldo was the point that I was making earlier when you're busy in your busy season in the summertime, 10, 12 hours, the battery's not going to go for the full day, whereas a tank of fuel, and you don't have a half an hour, 45 minutes between students to go and charge up the car. So going full of, fully electric is not a viable alternative. Uh, Colton, uh, if buy a hybrid, it will not be a plug-in hybrid. I don't want to have to keep track of a charging cable that should be used to power a small travel trailer. <laughs> Fair enough, Colton. Uh, uh, Jake, Tesla Semi, they are brand new in California by the manufacturer hauling widgets. Uh, come back to me in four years of fast charging every day in Nunavut hauling super bees of logs. <laughs> yeah, we're just not there for hauling heavy with batteries. As we said, the battery technology is okay for cars. The battery technology is not there for heavy hauling. It's not not even you need to, don't even need to go to that extreme, Jake, of going to the extreme north hauling super bees. I mean, you just have to talk about hauling heavy in the states where you're hauling metal, you're hauling lumber, you're hauling anything that's liquid, and you're running out at full capacity of eighty thousand pounds. Electric batteries do not have the power cap capacity to haul that, and it's exactly what you said. What is the degradation? I mean, how much do the batteries go down over time? 
I mean, we don't know that yet. Those questions haven't been answered about the viability and the reliability of the batteries over time. Uh, Young, even iPhones take one hour to charge from zero to 100%. And yes, that is, again, that's true, right? So, and we also know that iPhones... <laughs> You go out in the cold and the and the phone is not next to your body heat, uh, the battery in that iPhone is going to degrade really fast. Last week I went out, I had a full charge of my phone. It was minus 20 degrees Celsius, you know, minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And I come back in, I looked at the phone, it was it had a 20% charge because of the extreme cold temperature outside. So the battery technology is going to degrade really fast in extreme cold temperatures. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Jake says, and drivers hate them anyway. Yes. Um, all right. So talking about electric vehicles tonight, uh, the other thing is if you're going for a driver's test, uh, go over to the Smart Drive Test website, check out Pass Your Driver's Test First Time Course Package, uh, pick that up, uh, guaranteed to pass your driver's test first time. And we include both the winter and defensive driving smart courses. Uh, you pick that up for about $37, $38 US and it's on sale. It has been on sale uh, for some time here. So you can pick that up for about 40% off. And again, guaranteed to pass your driver's test first time. And we include both the winter and defensive driving smart courses. Excellent. Uh, Colton electric only powertrain. If I... Only if I have a lot of solar panels. <laughs> yes, a lot of solar panels for sure. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a viable alternative as well. And one of the things that we, that's one of the things we don't have here uh, in Western Canada, whereas if you go to the Midwest or you go to Ontario, they have huge banks of solar panels, uh, especially on the farms and those types of things. But uh, one of the other, and I mean, there's, there's, <sighs> You know, there's backlash. There are environmental groups that are opposed to all of this, electric vehicles, uh, wind farms, and uh, solar panels, and those types of things. They don't want to see them, right? For whatever reason. Uh, wind farms, they say, are uh, damaging to bird life and those types of things. They're visually unattractive, whatnot, uh, and they don't generate a great deal of electricity. So our wind farms something that we should abandon because they don't generate a lot of electricity, but there are a lot of them in and around the, uh, the world. So, but there is opposition to these in the same way that there is opposition to electric vehicles. And we want to try and be, you know, we want to give a fair argument on both sides. Yes, electric vehicles are potentially a new power source that could potentially be more have less environmental impact than gasoline and diesel engines but are they reliable do they get the range uh you know that we need for personal commuting uh chewy uh climate change <laughs> that's another topic my friend am i a believer of climate change i don't know maybe it is maybe it's not i mean the reason that I am dubious about climate change, and yes, I am dubious about climate change, because the same thing that people have been saying for the last 20 years, that there is a finite amount of petroleum oil or fossil fuels in the ground, but yet somehow we keep seeing, being able to find new sources of petroleum fuel. It's the same thing with climate change. I don't know. Maybe it's a, cycl a cyclical weather pattern that, you know, every 200, 300 years, we get a warming of our climate. And it's interesting that it used to be global warming, and now it's not global warming anymore. Now it's climate change. Is it or isn't it? Scientists say that it is. Uh, some scientists say that it's not. There's no consensus on that we are having climate change. And you know, as a, <laughs> you know, with the cost of everything going up right now, with proposed supposedly inflation, I find it difficult to believe that these uh, carbon taxes and all these other environmental taxes that we're putting in place are going to solve the problem of whatever we perceive to be climate change. I just don't think it's going to happen. Uh, Colton, I'm going to roll out and clear notifications. See you all next week. Colton, have an awesome night, my friend. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, 
Ariana, would you consider hybrids a good middle ground between electric and gas, or would you still prefer gas regardless? Ariana, no, I would consider buying a hybrid. Uh, for my purposes, yes, definitely a hybrid is an excellent middle ground. Uh, you have the, the best of both. You have an electric engine, battery packs, you have a petrol engine, and when the petrol engine is running, it's charging the batteries in the hybrid vehicle. Also, when you're braking, going downhill, those types of things, all of that is charging the batteries in your vehicle. Uh, close. Diesel engines are good engines. The infrastructure for the electric cars aren't good in southern Germany, too. And it's still in its beginning phases, the seminal phases. Uh, and, you know, a few charging stations around and those types of things. Uh, I think we're putting the horse before the cart when it comes to electric vehicles. I think there's a lot more research and studies that need to be done. And as well, the longevity of this, as we've talked about here, about how long are these batteries going to last. And the other piece is it, as I said previously in the presentation, these electric man uh, car manufacturers are not in the car manufacturing business. They are in the battery business. It's the same thing as McDonald's. A lot of people think that McDonald's is in the fast food business. They are not. They are in the real estate business. And it is the same thing with car manufacturers and with Apple Macintosh computers, iPhones. They are in the battery business. It is battery technology that has allowed this technology to be developed. And it is the same thing with Tesla semi-trucks, uh, Tesla cars and those types of things. And personally, with the semi-trucks, the Tesla semi-trucks, I think it is nothing more than a, than a marketing ploy on the part of Tesla to sell their cars. And I don't think it's going to work out for them uh, in terms of the semi-trucks because the batteries have not, the battery technology is just not there. It's too big. It's too cumbersome. It's kind of like the first Motorola cell phones. And if you don't know what one of those are, uh, just go on to Google and Google Motorola cell phone. Uh, the first Motorola cell phones were like these two-handed, <laughs> they were essentially a phone booth on wheels they could carry around and make cell phone calls. Uh, not like the technology that we have today because of advancements in batteries. So that's where we're at. Uh, Yamika, uh, electric car base models are very expensive to keep plus car insurance for an average person. Uh, yes, electric cars are expensive to purchase. There's no doubt about it. A uh, new electric car probably is going to run you $40,000, $50,000. Not to mention the environmental impact of simply manufacturing the vehicle. Who can afford that? Some people can, some people can't. And again, then we have the second-hand market. Is there going to be a second-hand market of electric vehicles? Because personally, I'm at a point in my life where I don't have enough disposable income that I'm ever going to buy a new car. I'm always going to buy a second-hand vehicle. So this is something else that time will tell us whether there's going to be a second-hand market with electric vehicles. Uh, Wyatt, Makita is moving to battery. I work at an equipment rental sales place. Look up Crest Tools. They're pretty cool. Awesome. Yes, and I mean battery technology. This is why we have all of these cordless tools, right? Which is another uh, draw on our electrical grid. You look at impact drivers, drills, uh, skill saws, uh, nailers, all of this, these tools that are now cordless tools because of battery power, right? Um, all, this, all the tools in the shop with impact drivers and uh, impact wrenches and those types of things. Again, another draw on our electrical grid for sure. But again, it has been made possible because of battery technology. DeWalt, Makita, uh, you know, Bosch, all these, they're in the battery development business. They're in the battery business. It's what made these tools possible. The tool doesn't cost anything, right? You can go out and pick up the tool for 80 or 90 bucks. It's the battery, a couple of batteries, 20 volt batteries, uh, for an impact driver or drill, they're 130 bucks for two of them. That's where the money is. It's in the battery technology. Uh, Jake Ford has the new Explorer with a small V6 and the hybrid powertrain. It is wicked fast. Prius don't sell vehicles to the car guys. Uh, speed and power should be a teamwork, not a sacrifice. <laughs> Excellent point, Jake. Uh, Mallory, what is an electric charging station? Uh, Mallory electric charging stations are just public charging stations where you can uh, plug in your car. Uh, a lot of municipalities have them for the city workers 
they drive electric vehicles, they can go in and uh, plug in their vehicle for the day there that they are at work. Uh, feisty EVs are good for personal use if you can charge them every day at home. Uh, personally, I have a short commute and the EV would have instant on heat and my old gas car doesn't heat up uh, the cabin in time. <laughs> you must have a really short commute then if, if the uh, petrol engine wouldn't heat up the cabin for you. But uh, yes, in that situation, an electric vehicle is going to do you really well and work out well for you. Uh, toxic. Uh, I work as a mechanic. Battery tools are cool, but pneumatic is a lot better and cheaper too. Uh, yes, toxic. I can't agree more. <laughs> uh, I was at my brother's in the summer waxing my mom's car that we bought her and uh, he had a pneumatic buffer and I just thought, oh my God, the pneumatic buffer just works so much better. But again, you're into cords, right? You're into cords for the air uh, airlines and whatnot. And it can be a bit of a pain in the butt. And sometimes there is, you know, there's there's a place for that for sure. And like you said, it works better. But, um, you know, electric, <laughs> hands-free, our power, cord, cords, cordless stuff, is what I was trying to say, uh, is just way, but so much cooler. Uh, Garden State, uh, I say we scrap all motor EV pistons and diesels and bring back the rotaries. Uh, happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> awesome. Yes, we could try give that a go as well. Uh, Jake, have a great night, sir. I hope you had a great Christmas and other assorted holidays. Happy uh, New Year to you and your family and to you as well, my friend. All the best. Thank you for tuning in and your contribution to the, the electric vehicle con conversation. That's what I was trying to say. Conversation. Thank you so much. So, yes. So, battery technology. And as I said, on the part of Tesla with their semi-trucks, I think it's a marketing it's just a marketing gimmick that it's not there yet. The battery technology is still too heavy for these vehicles and it works in a personal vehicle, but again, it's longevity. How long do the batteries last? Where are we gonna dispose of them? Can we recycle them? Those types of things. And uh, there are, you know, there has been stuff posted on the internet. I don't know whether this is true or not, but that there are these scrap yards uh in europe where they've you know the municipalities have bought a whole fleet of electric vehicles and then the they cannot get replacement batteries for the vehicles that have stopped working and they just have these scrap yards full of these vehicles that they can no longer use uh because they cannot get battery replacements uh for the vehicles uh ariana are acceptable batteries still viable replaceable batteries uh ariana i you know, that's the other piece. Are replacement batteries going to work? First, are they going to work? Second, what is the cost of replacement batteries? Because I've heard horrific numbers uh, for replacement batteries for these electric vehicles, like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, which is the cost of almost a new car. And again, it comes back to what I was saying before. It's not the vehicle, it's the battery. And the battery is incredibly expensive. Uh, Mallory, I rely on technology with voice so I can do things like comment on your live streams. Awesome. So yes, so again, another piece of technology that allows people with disabilities to be able to communicate and to be able to live a better quality life for sure. Uh, Klaus, before I uh, was driving a full EV, I will take the train to work. It's much more relaxing. <laughs> I tend to agree with you, Klaus. If I can take public transport, that is a much, much better uh, alternative for sure. Uh, Epic, another thing you would see with uh, plug-in hybrids is that some of them are actually diesel engine plug-in hybrids common in Europe, but not North America. Uh, combines diesel efficiency with EV power, and yes, sounds like a really terrific uh, hybrid version of a vehicle. Uh, Sage, is there a cool hybrid car that's not a Prius? <laughs> that's awesome, Sage. That's awesome. Uh, yes, there are quite a number of hybrid vehicles now that are not Priuses for sure because uh, it is not a sexy car. I tend to agree with you. Yes, it has longevity. It's reliable and those types of things, but the Prius is not a sexy car. <laughs> so yes, but there are other other hybrids out there for sure. Uh, Wyatt, my Jeep gets up to temperature in less than five minutes, even right around zero degrees Celsius. Uh, it's a good idea to warm your vehicle up beforehand for the heat and defrost. Uh, Wyatt, no, you don't have to warm your car up. We've talked about this, Wyatt. 
<laughs> the only thing that you're heating up is the engine. You're not heating up the transmission. You're not heating up the drivetrain. You're not heating up the tires. Uh, it's better to start it up, take the two or three minutes you need to clean the vehicle off, and then drive it moderately, uh, and it will actually warm up faster than if you just leave it sitting there idling. Okay, any modern electronic view, uh, uh, gasoline engine doesn't need to be warmed up. Even the old buggy uh, that I have, my 1998 Honda CRV, it was minus 25 here last week, all week, and every day it started up, right? And of course, it takes a long time for it to warm up when it's that cold out. <laughs> But uh, you don't need to let it sit there and run for longer than a couple, three minutes. Uh, David, what about the fire hazards of the vehicles? Uh, don't think there's a lot of fire hazards with electric vehicles for sure. Nothing more uh, serious than what you would have with a diesel or a gasoline engine for sure. Uh, Scarlett says the new Prius is cool. So yes, I'll have to have a look at that. Uh, Chewy, they just revamped it. It looks angry. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, Garden State Honda had a cool hybrid uh, with a five-speed back in the day. Forgot the name, though. Uh, Wyatt, I agree. I was thinking about getting your cab heated up more than the engine. Uh, yes, and uh, that's what you need to do. Is, you know, you're only heating up the cab. And uh, I like the story about my mate <laughs> who lives upstairs in the suite upstairs where I live here. Uh, he has a big Dodge and uh, he lets it sit in the driveway for five or 10 minutes idling away every day. And uh, was in it one day, <laughs> he turns on the seat seat warmers and he says, oh, you know, you can get your butt nice and warm. I'm like, oh, okay, cool, so it's got seat warmers. And he says, oh yeah, and it's got a heated steering wheel too. I started laughing, I said, so why do you let this thing heat up for 15 minutes in the driveway every morning? <laughs> but that's what it is. Uh, the CRX is Honda. Sorry, CRZ. Okay, there you go. Uh, Mallory, if you had a choice of a hybrid car, which one would you drive and why? Uh, for me, it would probably be the RAV4. That's the hybrid that I would probably pick. Uh, I, it's reliable. It's a Toyota product, and it's been around for a long time and does really well. So that would probably be the one that I would pick. Uh, uh, Garden State says he would pick the Honda CRV for sure. Uh, I don't know about the new Honda CRVs. Again, I would have to do some research uh, if I was going to buy a CRV for sure. But, um, you know, that's the argument. And unfortunately, I don't have a clear position on electric vehicles other than I just don't think that the battery technology is there yet to move forward with electric vehicles. I think that where we need to put our energies in terms of moving forward and reducing fuel consumption is with hybrids. That's where I think that we should uh, invest our energies in terms of moving forward in environmentalism and reducing the amount of fuel that we're using in our lives. I just don't think that electric vehicles are just there yet. Same thing with um, you know, <laughs> self-driving cars. They're not coming for a very long time. So uh, why it says uh, Hyundai has some cool looking electric vehicles as well. Uh, Zara haven't seen the new Prius. It's a must see. Excellent. So definitely have a look at that as well. Okay. Check out the passenger driver's test first time over at the smart drive test uh, website. Passenger driver's test first time guaranteed. And as well, the smarter defensive driving and the winter driving courses are included in that package. You passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks. Congratulations. You got a driver's test coming up in the next week or so. Good luck in that. And uh, Happy New Year to everybody. We'll see you next year in 2023. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your questions and answers. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.